The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. It is unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorized. Neither the podcast nor any individual involved in its production is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoy it. Cersei smiles brightly at Sir Lewin Martell, the King's Guard stepping aside as she approaches the door to Rhaegar's chambers. Good morning, sir. Expecting the Dornishman's usual cool courtesy, she is surprised to find her smile returned. It certainly is, my lady. Cersei, my darling, what a wonderful surprise. Your Grace, I... You were expecting my son, I know. Rhaegar asked me to convey his apologies, but I'm afraid urgent business has called him away from the Red Keep for the day. Rhaella frowns in sympathy at Cersei's evident disappointment. And after you went all the trouble of bringing your own heart this time as well. Perhaps another time, then. Apologies for disturbing you, Your Grace. Cersei moves to depart, but Rhaella clutches her arm in sudden concern. Dear child, whatever have you done with your hair? Cersei raises her free hand self-consciously to her scalp, her long golden locks fashioned into a half-halo atop her head, thin braids wrapped about its length. Despite her best efforts, the halo persists in sitting askew, the braids slack and frayed from the friction of holding it in place. I'm afraid I don't have much experience of the style worn here at court. May I? Rayella begins to fuss at Cersei's hair. Lewin does his best to disguise his amusement at the pink blush rising in the young girl's cheeks. Oh, look at that. I've only made it worse. Come in, and I'll start all over. That's very kind, Your Grace, but I wouldn't dream of imposing. Oh, hush! How could I ever forgive myself if I sent you off to roam the castle looking such a fright? In, in! The Queen shoes Circe inside and ushers her to a seat before an elaborately carved vanity mirror. Now, you set that harp aside and take a seat right here. Rayella commences her work, pulling a dozen pins and clips from Circe's poor approximation of the courtly style until her hair hangs long and free behind her shoulders. Rayella runs her fingers down its length admiringly. Oh, my shining stars, you have such beautiful hair. You're too kind, Your Grace. Rayella waves a finger at the mirrored Circe in admonishment. Now, what did we agree about that, young lady? Forgive me, Rayella. Satisfied, the Queen returns to combing out Circe's lustrous golden mane. Half closing her eyes, Circe luxuriates in the feel of Rayella's hands playing gently through her hair. I can just about remember my mother combing my hair each night before I went to bed. Jamie's too. He always insisted on keeping it exactly as long as my own. Cersei glances at Rayella's reflection, weighing her words carefully. Rayella, if I may, about what happened in the yard yesterday. The Queen waves a hand at the air in dismissal. Let's not waste our words on such silliness. Boys will be boys, and it will have done my little prince no harm to have his pride pricked a little. I know Jamie feels an absolute fool about the whole affair. He barely slept at all last night, he was so distraught. You're a good sister to worry so on his behalf. 
The two of you seem very close. We've pretty much had the run of the rock since we were children. I spent some time with daughters of my father's bannermen on occasion, and my Aunt Jenna would visit with us when she could, but mostly it's just been the two of us. A sweet and kindly aunt is poor substitute for a mother, particularly a woman as wonderful as Joanna. I used to do this for her too, would you believe? My Ara as well. That was Elia's mother, God's rest her soul. I had to teach them both. Then your mother taught my Ara and I the Westland style, and my Ara showed us how to fashion beautiful long braids like they wear down in Dawn. Or used to, anyway. An old woman like myself cannot be expected to keep up with all the latest fashions. Nonsense, Rayla. You and Rhaegar could almost pass for twins yourselves. As she protests, Cersei tries to turn her head to face Rhaella, but the Queen raises a hand to restrain her. Hold still, wicked girl. Do you want to end up as a pincushion? Cersei does as she's told, actually seeming to take a certain pleasure from Rhaella's maternal scolding. I noticed you don't keep ladies in waiting anymore. Nor any in the castle's service. Even the kitchens are staffed entirely by men. <sighs> In truth, I've been rather bereft of female company since Joanna returned home. I have Elia, of course, but even in the best of health, she has her hands full with her own family. Cersei looks down at her hands, fluttering nervously like the wings of a settling bird. She watches Rayella in the mirror for a long moment. What was she like? My mother... Rayella stops her labours and meets Cersei's eye in the glass. She smiles wistfully and lays a palm on the side of Cersei's head, softly stroking her hair. Radiant. She was the light of every room she walked into. You might think I would be jealous, the princess outshone by her lady-in-waiting. But it was impossible to begrudge your mother anything. She didn't preen or pander to get the boy's attention. They gave it gladly. Like mother, like daughter in that regard. You'll make me blush. Don't pretend you haven't noticed the stir you've caused. I can't remember the last time the men at court were quite so finely groomed. When they see you coming, they puff out their chests and strut past like prize cocks at market. Well, perhaps I noticed one or two looking my way. My Ara was slightly older than your mother and I, and a sight more experienced in the company of men. She'd already lived a full life down in Dawn before she came to us in the capital, and we'd prod and poke and pester her to tell us all her scandalous stories. When your father came courting after your mother, Mayara had us practice before his visits. I'd play the part of Lord Tywin, so tall and proud and serious. Mayara would school Joanna in all the things she'd learned men so loved to hear. I got rather good at impersonating your father, actually. <laughs> For his name day one year, the three of us took our little performance public and I paraded before the whole court in a red and gold doublet and lion branded leathers with a fluffy little goatee made from kitten fur glued to my face. You didn't. How did my father react? He wasn't best pleased at first. But then he saw how much his Joanna was enjoying herself. Believe it or not, I'm fairly certain I even saw him smile a little. That's why radiant was the first word to spring to mind. It would be easier to carry ice across the Dornish desert than it would be to keep any kind of frown in your mother's presence. I think those days with your mother and my Ara were the happiest of my life. With a small shake of her head, the Queen returns to the present and considers Cersei's reflection. Has your father never told you any of this? I used to ask, but I think it was still too painful for him. So eventually I just stopped asking. He has her portrait hanging in his study, on the wall facing his writing desk. Jamie and I used to sneak in when he was away and spent hours just staring at her. I even broke my wrist once, falling off the dresser while climbing up so I could touch her face. Oh, my sweet baby angel, how heartbreaking. What did your father say? Jamie told him he'd accidentally hit me with a training sword. I ended up in more trouble for playing at soldiers than I would have if Jamie had just told Father the truth. Pinning the final braid in place, Rayello steps back and admires her handiwork. There we are. All done. Cersei studies her reflection admiringly, tilting her head so she might appreciate its expertly shaped architecture. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Rayella. It looks wonderful. Now you look as though you truly belong here at court. 
Why don't we take a stroll through the gardens and really give those strutting cocks something to stare at? I'd hate to take up any more of your time. Nonsense. You run back to your chambers and drop off that harp of yours, and then come and meet me down in the gardens, and I'll tell you more stories of mine and your mother's misspent youth. I can think of nothing I should like better. Nor I, sweet girl. Now, run along, and I'll break the news to Sir Lewin that he's on childminding duty. It'll be worth a chuckle seeing his face. There is nothing the King's Guard enjoy more than watching over infants. How long have you been with us now, Lord Varys? A little over three months, by my account. Sitting before Tywin's desk, Varys shifts self-consciously in his chair as the gold-flecked green eyes of the King's hand study him coolly over a pair of steepled fingers. Three months. And how is it that in those three months, a master of whispers that has had so little occasion to contribute in council should somehow supply intelligence enough to satisfy a king in chambers? The king gave me instruction to watch, to listen, and to report. He provided no such license in exercising the powers of my office outside these parameters, my lord. Which is precisely the reason I took the responsibility for small council appointments upon myself many years ago. Had I not, the realm would be served today by naught but the compliant toadies of the king. Well, naturally, your own are much preferred. Useful fools are only as useful as the colours upon their surcoat, Lord Varys, and only as foolish as their masters permit. Are you suggesting I am a fool, my lord? I'm questioning whether you're useful. However much it may displease you, I did receive my appointment directly from his grace. I am under his protection. Ha! Why is that amusing? Aerys Targaryen hasn't so much as bared his teeth to me in twenty years. Not when I picked Chelstead and Valerian from the gutter, nor when I bought the loyalties of Simon Staunton with a seat on the small council. If I can make three masters without the slightest pushback from the king, I shouldn't think it likely he'd bestir himself on your behalf should it please me to unmake another. Varys makes no reply, his confidence in the king's patronage diminished, if not yet entirely dispelled. You remain unconvinced? Very well. Let us test that uncertainty, shall we? Tywin moves to stand, but Varys quickly holds up a hand to stay his rise. You must appreciate the difficult position in which you put me, my lord. Must I? I have been frank with you as regards my remit from the king, but if his grace were to suspect me of serving two masters, I fear my time here at court would soon come to a most abrupt and decisive end. By way of reply, Tywin pulls out the topmost drawer of his desk and retrieves a piece of rolled parchment, the broken wax bereft of any seal. Without comment, he places the scroll on the table between he and Varys. I've never been troubled by spiders. Flies, however, I find exceedingly irritating. So when I discover a spider in my chambers, I don't crush it beneath my boot as others might. I allow it to spin its web in the corner of my window so I might count how many flies it saves me from having to swat. But a spider that catches none. Varys looks at the scroll, then at Tywin, then back to the scroll. He has little notion of what may be written upon the parchment, nor who it may be from, but is shrewd enough to infer that Tywin means to wield its contents like a knife against the throat. As a consequence of the disruption to our trade routes with the arbour, the price of Dornish red has near, tri near tripled in the city's taverns and wine sinks. Prince Doran is of a mind to seize upon the opportunity to force a renegotiation of terms with the Crown's import offices. Come, Lord Varys, my expectations for you may be modest, but I would at least hope you would strive to exceed the contributions of Carlton Chelstead. He informed me of Lord Doran's intentions three days ago. Sir Jamie's adventures with the King's Guard. Sir Barristan made the invitation, and the Lord Commander suffered the imposition, but the order came from the King. To what ends, I cannot say for certain, but it seems plain that Ares means to strike at you through your son and heir. For the moment, it serves my purposes to allow Ares to play his clumsy little games with my son, but that does not mean I am ignorant to their design. You shall have to do better than that.
Varys looks once more at the scroll, his tongue darting out to lick his dry lips, like a gambler unnerved by his opponent's bluff. Prince Rhaegar recently paid a tempestuous call upon the king. It would appear he and his father are at considerable odds over the prince's proposal for the night's watch. Tywin's eyes narrow as he studies Varys's face in silent deliberation. Finally, he takes up the scroll and returns it to the desk drawer. Go on. Nodding her good mornings to the Tully guards on duty, Catelyn passes from the yard and starts across the heavy wooden drawbridge beyond the gates of River Run. My lady! Catelyn turns to find Brandon hurrying from the castle in her direction. My lady, I missed you at the breakfast table this morning. I was eager to take the walk I missed yesterday. I, I would have liked... That is to say, I had hoped I might apologise for my discourtesy upon the battlement. And the absence of a breakfast table has dashed those hopes? Brandon smiles at Catelyn's retort, but her cold demeanour shows no signs of thawing. I have made for a very poor guest since my arrival, and an even poorer betrothed. I should have taken more care to consider your feelings, and for that I sincerely beg your pardon. Everything has been moving so quickly. I believe I never really... Lord Stark! Peter and Edmure pass beneath the walls of River Run to join Brandon and Catelyn upon the drawbridge, a pair of fishing rods slung across the latter's shoulder. Edmure and I were just heading to the Tumblestone for a spot of fishing. Care to join us? Thank you, Lord Baelish, but my morning is promised to the Lady Catelyn. <laughs> What's the matter, Lord Stark? Worried I'll show you up in front of your beloved? Another time, perhaps. I think some friendly competition sounds a wonderful idea. Brandon reacts with surprise at Catelyn's sudden reversal. Are you sure? Fishing can be rather tedious, especially so for spectators. Absolutely. It looks as though we'll have some sun this afternoon. Lysa and I can sit on the bank and keep one another company. If you require further enticement, Lord Stark, perhaps we might spice the pot with a small wager? Say, a silver stag for every fish more the winner catches? Brandon hesitates, searching Catelyn's face for signs of a trap, wary of giving further offence. Finally, he turns and offers his hand to Peter to seal the terms. As you wish, Lord Peter. May the best man win. I must confess, I never did imagine predilections towards the perverse to be quite so prevalent among the nobility. I must have passed a dozen faces familiar from about the Red Keep on my progress to your chambers. The gamut of perversity is bound by neither class nor imagination, my friend, but only by the coin in one's pockets. Faris sits before Illyrio's desk, the Magister sipping at a cup of wine as they pick over Varys's latest debrief. Now, what news from atop Aegon's High Hill? An apothecary. A Magi, a Red Priest, and a Black Brother of the Night's Watch walk into the King's Solar. Oh, I believe I've heard this joke before. If only it were a joke, but no, this is how I spent last evening. At Queen Rhaella's suggestion, the King commanded me to round up this sorry cavalcade in the hopes of finding a cure for his restless nights of late. Leeches? Leeches, your grace. A dozen applied about the body every night before sleep. The enervating effect of their application is well established as a means of inducing a restful slumber. Eris sits in his chair by the hearth, Varys and Pycelle hovering at either shoulder. Before them stand as odd an assemblage of characters as the Red Keep has hosted in quite some time. A wizened and white-haired apothecary, a lazarine magi, a red-robed priestess of law, attended by a dwarf, and a flinty-mannered recruiter from the Night's Watch, by the name of Yoran. What nonsense! The king is troubled with wakefulness, not a distemper of the blood. Which is why the wildling poultice are recommended is the answer for what ails you, your grace. If the Grand Meister would be so good as to find me a measure of acorn paste and a sample of shadow cat shit, begging your pardon, your grace. I can... Shadow Cat? Gods be good! You would have his grace trust in the superstitions of savages? 
Leeches clean the blood and poultices calm the humours, but only fire can purify the spirit. While Picel positively reels in offended astonishment, the Red Priestess silently but sagely nods at the Magi's suggestion. Seal yourself in a windowless room, as naked as the day you came into this world. Build two fires, one apart from the willow tree, and another of hair from the head of a maiden. I should have you executed for treason for even suggesting such a thing. Don't you know your histories, woman? Let her finish, Grandmaster. The flames shall draw forth the ill humours through the skin to pull in puddles at your feet. Really? Never in all my days. Your Grace, while I'm sure Queen Raella had naught but the very best of intentions, I am confident that I can devise a method of treatment that... You, Priestess, what do you have to say for yourself? Forgive my lady, Your Grace, but she does not speak the common tongue. If it please, Your Grace, I will interpret her words for your understanding. Very well. What does she suggest for a man with my affliction? Vestragon Miros? Ah, Idruas, Eshadrihi? And what was that? More talk of burning hair and puddles, perhaps? She asks, Do you dream of dragons, Your Grace? The colour drains from Eris's face. What has my wife told you? Kul Unjiak Dari. Dobri, Mili. I have seen. Your restlessness is not the disease. It is merely the symptom. It is the dreams that plague you. Eris looks into the priestess's eyes, his own narrowed in circumspection. She returns his gaze, unblinking. Leave me with her. Your Grace, these charlatans have naught to offer you, but... Out, I said. Pycel reluctantly herds the others from the room. Varys surveys a wide berth to keep as much distance as possible between himself and the Red Priestess. What do you know of my dreams? Kulakim esh zaldrizi idruas. Idruas a mizagon, vestriazir mizi larazion. Dreams are but a portent of things to come. For those who possess the second sight to see through their fog of riddles, the future opens out wide and clear like an undisturbed sea. Truly? She said all that? Volantine is a tongue near as economical as it is evocative, Your Grace. Tibeu daro gion anogarual eshkim esh saldrizi. The dwarf reaches into his pocket and produces a large needle. Eris glances at the door, silently calculating whether he can outpace a dwarf if the need should arise. Allow me but one drop of your royal blood, and I will tell you why these dragons harry at the fringes of your knowing. Eris considers, inspecting the dwarf's face for signs of malice, then holds out his hand, index finger extended. Play me for a fool, witch, and I will make you suffer for it. You and your dwarf. My name is Hopbean, if it please your grace. And in truth I do not belong to my lady, but to the temple of the Lord of Light, and I have done so since I was a child. My father was a lowly... The priestess interrupts the dwarf's backstory with a swift boot to his posterior. She glowers at him as he rubs it reproachfully. Accepting his reprimand, the dwarf presents his needle and pricks Eris's fingertip, drawing forth a single bead of blood. The priestess drops to her knees and wraps her lips about Eris's finger, suckling its tip as a newborn does its mother's teat. Eris's expression lies somewhere between revulsion and rhapsody, though undoubtedly verging on the disappointed when the priestess removes his finger and stands. Ar, urnen. I see... Ar, urnen, ar. I see you marching into battle, dressed in plate of crimson and black. The stepstones. Ah, oh. No. Ar, urnen, doros, a, a city. Ah, oh. 
not Odio not a city. Lentor. A town. Y Lentor. Or, or a village. Dragon. En Barza. Close upon the sea. Gile Danger all around. Mazumbil. Zobri. Darkness. Zobri egrosso. Blades in the darkness. A orno. I see. A nogar. Blood. Carisic. Zi. Nogar. Fire and blood. A battle. Vili Basma. Oh, ah. No. Oh, Vili Basma. No, not a battle. Vili Bagon. Uh, um. Vili Bagon. Forgive me, Your Grace. There is no word in the common tongue that fully expresses her meaning. A war? Not a war, no. Something smaller. Something more... personal. A revolt? A rebellion? Closer, but, but still no. The volunteer word implies more of a, a resistance or a refusal. Oh, Vili Basma. Vili uh, Yes, yes. A defiance. She sees a defiance. Against who? When will it come? Who would dare defy me? Skoolus? Skooi? Zobri? Meri? Zobri? She cannot say who. Darkness, she sees. Only darkness. Ipradegon. Drakeris. The flame of the dragon. Ah, Jorago. Irenon. Will devour the darkness. You will stand Rokwa. glorious and Green proud tios. upon the ashes of your enemies. Eris's eyes are wide as a child's, ensorcelled by its favourite bedtime story, the faintest hint of tears glistening upon his lower lids. Beza, this is why dragons Galbrizi, haunt your dreams. They are a portent of things to come. Zalbrizi, a portent Zalbrizi, of the dragon reborn. Lysa and Catelyn sit on the banks of the Tumblestone, their dresses hiked up to their knees and their feet dangling in the water. Upriver, Brandon stands with pole in hand, patiently waiting for another bite. Downriver, Peter bickers with Edmure, sending the young lord wading into the water to inspect his line. How do you think Peter's doing? I haven't been paying attention to what Peter's doing. That would be a first. I think he's caught three. Really? Catelyn looks up, reading the progress of the sun across the clear blue sky. Hmm. I believe that's just about time. Gentlemen! I hope Brandon hasn't beaten him too badly. You know how Peter covets his savings. Peter and Edmure arrive first, poor Edmure wet through after taking a spill on his exit from the river. Well? Peter proudly raises a loft, three silver-scaled minnows hanging from a string. Oh, Peter, that's wonderful! Well done, you! I think Peter may have you beat, my lord. Brandon inspects Peter's hall and nods appreciatively. On another day, may well have, but it seems the old gods must have travelled south of me to grant their favour. Brandon raises aloft three fat trout, each as long as his forearm and twice as wide. Look at those monsters! It looks like we have a tie. Hardly. All three of little fingers don't weigh even half so much as just one of Brandon's. Peter shoots daggers at Edmure, but then reaches into his pocket and retrieves two silvers. Without a word, but his face as eloquent as a eulogy, Peter tosses them to Brandon. There's no need, really. We never took size into account when we agreed our terms. The larger man rarely does. Keep it. It's not only Lannisters that pay their debts. Well, if you insist. Brandon crouches beside Catelyn and hands her one of his coins. Your share of the winnings, my lady? Catelyn takes the coin, but remains unreceptive to his earnest smile. Perhaps Peter would like a chance to recover his losses? The fishing party turns to Peter. He studies Catelyn, striving in vain to discern her intentions. What fashion of contest did my lady have in mind? Ooh, a joust. Oh, don't be absurd, Edmure. A horse race, then. Peter doesn't like horses. Not since Florian bit him on his... nethers. Florian is your stable hand? Florian's my pony. How about a hunt? Or an archery competition? I think I've neglected the Lady Catelyn quite enough already. Perhaps we might take a horse ride together? Brandon looks solicitously to his betrothed. Why not all three? 
I have a few suggestions in mind, and I'm certain Lysa could think of a couple more. We can have our own little tourney right here at home. Get ourselves in the mood for the festivities at Harrenhal. Lysa glances at Peter, knowing the wound to his pride in their previous conversation about Harrenhal has almost certainly yet to heal. But if Peter feels the sting, he gives no outward sign. A splendid idea, my lady. What say you, Lord Stark? Now it's Brandon's turn to feel four pairs of eyes upon him, awaiting his decision. Like Peter before him, he searches Catelyn's face, but finds only an enigmatic half-smile and a pair of eyebrows raised expectantly. If it puts your mind at ease, I don't recall any snarks or grumpkins ever being sighted in these woods. I know how you northerners tremble at the notion. Brandon ignores the slight, but his demeanour hardens somewhat at Catelyn's amusement. He answers without turning his eyes away from Catelyn's own, his voice suddenly stiffened with antagonistic resolve. What stakes this time? How heavy is your coin purse? Let's say a silver piece for every bird, a gold for every rabbit or hare, and ten whole dragons for a pig or deer. Perhaps twenty dragons to the winner of the horse race, and another twenty to the highest score with bow and arrow. Peter, don't! Lysa and Edmure immediately retreat into huddled conference with Peter, the former lamenting the dangers to Peter's health, both physical and monetary, and the latter positively bouncing with excitement at the very same. Left alone together, Catelyn stands and faces Brandon. If you're looking to punish me somehow for the crosswords that passed between us, you could have conceived as something a little less costly. Don't worry, Brandon. You shared your winnings. It's only fair I cover half your losses should Peter beat you. She ambles over to join the others. Facing down all three residents of River Run grouped together, Brandon feels his prideful instincts leaving him little recourse but to accept their challenge. Very well. Let the games begin. As Circe approaches the trellis-covered patio overlooking the sea, she is surprised to discover a small child leaning against the garden wall, his back to the stone pathway Circe walks. As she gets closer, the realisation dawns that his proportions are not those of a child at all. She stops, struck stone still in her progress. Tyrion, what are you? The dwarf turns to face her, and Cersei realises her mistake. This man is closer to her father's age than her youngest brother's. Apologies, sir. I mistook you for someone else. Before Hopbean can reply, Rayella appears from the patio, in the company of a tall and slender woman, dressed in the red robes of a priestess of R'hllor. Once more, it's been lovely to see you, and best of luck with the new show. Thank you, Your Grace. Your patronage has always been a blessing. Bowing to the Queen, the Priestess and the Dwarf make their exit. There you are, sweetling. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten me. Come, let us sit. Jonathor stands at attention against the trellis wall. He nods to Circe in greeting as she and Rayella take the seats at a small picnic table upon which sits a four-tiered silver cake stand, heavy laden with a richly coloured assortment of pastries and sweet treats. A Dornish red. Rayella pours them both a generous serving of wine and sips appreciatively at her own. I hear it's tripled in price since this awful business with the arbour, but fortunately we're still working our way through the Barrels Prince Doran centres where my grandson was born. I hope you like it. I'm afraid I don't have a very experienced palate. I'm not much of a drinker. That will change soon enough, if you mean to find yourself a husband here at court. How so? The days can be long and tedious for the newlywed without wine to make the hours pass more swiftly. Nothing much is expected from a wife, you see, besides keeping her husband's castle and making herself look presentable. But being a woman of means, you'll have a maester to manage the first, and ladies in waiting to see to the second. You'll be bored out of your skull, I promise you. Until the children come along, of course. That's when you'll really learn to appreciate the virtues of a fine, tall glass of wine. <laughs> look at your face. You must think me a terrible mother raising my boys with a bottle in hand. Not at all, Your Grace. 
I cannot speak to Prince Viserys, but if he should grow up to be even half the man his brother is, you'll have done the realm a wonderful service. Yes, I did rather well there. I'm not too humble to admit. He's a very special boy, my Rhaegar. He shall make a wonderful king someday. The people adore him. He's always been special to me, whether he was son to a king or not. Since the day he was born, he's been special. My beautiful, shining shield. Proof that I could give Ares the sons he wanted so desperately. Rayella sees the curiosity in Cersei's eyes. She pauses a moment, as though debating with herself exactly how much she cares to share. I lost four children before Rhaegar, and another four before Viserys. Three were miscarriages, two were stillborn. The three that survived childbirth, the three I've no doubt you've heard of, Daron, Egon, and Jaehaerys, named for my father, all of them were taken from us before their first name day. I'm so sorry for your loss, Your Grace. Cersei reaches out and wraps her hand around Rhaella's own. I cannot imagine how painful it must have been for the two of you. I cannot speak to the king's pain. He and I were never close as brother and sister, and any chance of our becoming so as husband and wife was soon extinguished. I even began to wonder if that was the problem. If perhaps the High Septon had the right of it when he decried brother laying down with sister as an abomination in the eyes of the gods. Perhaps we were being punished for marrying without the faith's blessing. Cursed by my father's hubris to suffer time and again the worst pain any parent can possibly know. It wasn't long after I suffered my second miscarriage that your mother announced that she was pregnant with twins. Miara and I were delighted, of course, but your mother... Oh, Cersei, you could have hung her smile in the sky in place of the sun. She was so happy. And selfish, as it may sound, caring for your mother, helping her through her pregnancy. You never knew it, but you and your brother were a great comfort to me. And so, when Tywin sent your mother home before I even had a chance to meet you... It almost felt as though the old curse had come again, just with a new twist on an old agony. Two more children snatched away from me. I pleaded with your father to let your mother stay, to raise you here at the Red Keep, but he was insistent. He wanted his children to grow up at the rock. And what about my mother? What did she want? Rayella looks at Cersei quietly for several seconds then raises the corners of her mouth in a sad and rueful smile. One day soon, you'll look back and realise how very young you sound, asking that question. Rayella reaches out and adds her second hand to their embrace, wrapping Cersei's hand in both of hers. Forgive me, child. I always hated it when bitter old women would tell me all the things I didn't understand. And I hated it too when they would unload on me all the heartache of their lives, and I would be forced to sit there and smile as though anything in my life could ever be so sad. But I hope at least that you now understand how much you mean to me, Cersei. Having you here is like having a little piece of your mother back. And God's how I've missed her. Robert sits before a well-fed fire in the solar of Storm's End, a cloth draped over his head, to contain the steam rising from a bowl of boiled water he holds in his lap. Robert lifts the corner of his cloth to discover Stannis standing by the fire, a wire-haired terrier sitting happily at his heel. Whose dog is that? That's my dog. Seriously, Stannis, if the servants are leaving doors open so wild dogs can one- Robert, the dog is mine. Really? I am capable of caring for things, you know. I'm not a monster. What's it called? Robert. Stannis? No. The dog's name is Robert. I allowed Renly to choose the name. Robert inspects his canine namesake, endeavouring to decide if he should be insulted or flattered. Stannis looks his brother over and is evidently unimpressed by what he finds. Have you spoke with Meister Crescent? Robert gestures dismissively at the bowl of steaming water and the cloth he wears about his shoulders. You don't imagine these were my idea, do you? Robert touches his lip, indicating to Stannis's own and the scabbed red welt Robert left there. You look to be healing well enough. Stannis grunts in agreement and takes the chair beside Robert's. 
He looks into the fire for a moment, permitting his dog to lick at his fingers. Your friend has been like a fly about my ear, insisting you and I should talk. Aye, he'll do that. I've heard nothing else since we left the Eyrie. I will begin the arrangements for Selyse and I to vacate our rooms. If you would care to choose which of the residences you would like me to garrison... Stannis, stop. Stannis frowns at Robert's interruption, readying himself for an argument. Renly will need both his brothers now mother and father are gone. And I have no intention of trekking across the Stormlands to some bloody keep every time I want to see you both. You and Selyse are staying put. Taken aback, Stannis permits himself a beat to properly grapple with Robert's gesture. I am your younger brother and you are my lord. If it is your wish that my wife and I remain here at Storm's End, then it is your prerogative to command as such. Robert rolls his eyes and sighs in exasperation. God's your hard work. I'm not commanding, Stannis. I'm offering. Can you not just say yes and shake my hand like a normal fucking person? Stannis looks at Robert's proffered paw as though it were a snake likely to rear up and bite him. After what seems an age, he finally grips Robert's hand in his own. I believe Selyse would like that very much. They break hands and sit in silence once more. Selyse tells me Renly's bathing again. He still hates washing himself as much as any boy his age, but he seems to be over his fear of the water at least. I suppose your tough love worked out well enough this time, as much as it pains me to admit. I know you and I don't exactly see eye to eye on such things, or very much at all for that matter. But I've been with Renly every day of his life. I know what's best for him because I know him better than you do. I'm sorry if that sounds cruel. Cruel, but no less true for being so. It seems to me there's very little about this place that you don't know better than I do. Which is why I'd like for you to continue on managing the Stormlands. I don't follow. This has been your home far longer than it has been mine. You know the land, you know the people, you know all the things a good lord should. You know it all so well. Father believed enough in you to entrust his kingdom to your care. I mean to follow in his example. I don't know what to say. You already said it. All this time I thought you resented me for leaving and saddling you with the burdens of the eldest son. But when you told me down on the beach that you wouldn't let me take Renly from you, that's when I finally realised you never saw them as burdens to begin with. And that's why you'll make a far better lord than I ever would. The Count has things stand entering our final contest. Littlefinger owes 20 gold dragons for the horse race, 5 for the foot race, 10 for the arm wrestling, Eight for the tree climbing, and twelve for the two rabbits and the fawn Brandon took in the hunt. In the opposite column, Brandon owes two silvers for the brace of pheasants Littlefinger felled. And that concludes the count. Edmure steps down from his improvised podium and crosses River Run's yard to stand beside a pair of archery targets mounted on straw-covered boards. Those pheasants were well taken, Peter. Peter smiles humorlessly as he and Brandon select their bows from a selection racked against the castle wall. I've always found the spear such a primitive weapon. Thrust and stab, thrust and stab. The bow and arrow, on the other hand, graceful, elegant, refined. I feel more confident just holding the bow in my hands. What say we go double or nothing? No, Peter! Did you not just hear the count? Brandon looks to Catelyn. She tilts her head and raises a shoulder in a half-shrug. Brandon sighs and holds out a hand towards the range in invitation. You have the honours? Peter walks to the shooting line. He rolls his shoulders, stretches to the sky, twists at the middle. Lysa watches his warm-up with a look of concern. Peter, why do you insist on embarrassing yourself like this? There's nothing embarrassing here, Lysa. Only fair and spirited competition between red-blooded men. Couldn't you at least suggest something more suited to your talents instead? Perhaps... 
a poetry writing contest. Oh, you write me such beautiful poems. Peter gives her a cold, silencing stare by way of reply, and Lysa retreats to the waiting line. He draws an arrow from the basket placed beside the shooting line, inspects its fletching, and knocks. Wait. Catelyn hurries over to Peter and removes the clutch of flowers laced about the thin cord tying back her hair. Here, this is for you. Catelyn ties the cord about Peter's wrist. He touches the petals with an expression of guarded wonder, his happy surprise overcoming his hard-earned scepticism. You want me to weigh your favour? A small peace offering, to apologise for my behaviour the other day. You were so sweet and I repaid your kindness with cruelty. I'd hate to think I'd ruined what we've always had between us. Catelyn gives Peter a peck on the cheek, but only once she's confident of Brandon's attention. Good luck, Peter. Catelyn returns to the others at the waiting line. Lysa shoots daggers at her sister, but Catelyn pretends not to notice. Peter takes a last look at the flowers on his wrist and knocks. One point. Five points. I hope your father sent you south with coin enough to cover your bets, Lord Stark. Three points. Nine points for Littlefinger. Peter curses under his breath and approaches the target, arguing with Edmure about his first arrow's placement, the self-appointed adjudicator refusing to budge from his ruling. Where does he get his money? He saves every copper a father ever gives him. He doesn't drink. He doesn't gamble. Well, not until today, anyway. I suppose when you come from modest means, you're more inclined to be careful with your coin. He's not been very careful with it now. I did ask him once why he cares so much about money. He told me it's much harder for lords and ladies to look down upon a man of humble birth when he's standing on a stack of golden dragons. Catelyn pays close attention to this exchange and watches Brandon's reaction with curiosity. Brandon walks out to the shooting line as Edmure finally succeeds in shooing Peter away from the target. Brandon knocks his first arrow. Five points. Brandon pulls his second arrow from the basket. He looks over at Lysa and Peter. At Peter's side, Lysa clutches his hand in both of hers, her anxiety plain to see. Peter, by contrast, is making his best effort at manly stoicism, but the sweat upon his brow and the white-knuckle pressure of his grip upon Lysa's hands betray his true emotions. Four points. Brandon pulls and knocks his third and final arrow. He assumes his stance, then looks again towards the waiting line. Peter and Lysa are unaware of his attention, their eyes fixed firmly upon the target, and their shoulders slumped in impending defeat. Brandon meets Catelyn's eyes, discovers her studying him with a small smile at the corner of her lips. Without turning back to the target, Brandon releases his arrow. Miss! Lysa throws her arms around Peter, lifting her heels and swinging them from side to side in jubilant abandon. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Peter! <laughs> Edmure looks incredulously at Brandon, then to the arrow buried in the straw-covered board, a foot to the left of the target. Peter smirks at Brandon over Lysa's shoulder. Thank you, Lord Stark. I shall put your coin to good use, I assure you. I don't doubt it, my friend. Before long, I shall have turned this one purse of gold and silver into one thousand. If in future you should ever find yourself struggling and in need of a loan, you need only come to me. I promise I shall grant you a very reasonable rate of interest. Catelyn strolls out to meet Brandon on the shooting line. That was a nice thing you did. Nice for Peter's purse, perhaps. I should have inspected the fletching on that last arrow. The flight was definitely off. Catelyn's smile broadens at Brandon's pretense at poor sportsmanship. Eighty gold dragons is a bitter loss for the heir to Winterfell, but to a poor boy from the Fingers, it's a small fortune. Forty. What do you mean? I owe Peter forty gold dragons, and so do you. 
You promised to cover half my losses, remember? Catelyn smiles, then rises up on her tiptoes to plant a kiss on Brandon's cheek. From Lysa's arms, Peter spies this moment of intimacy, causing the improbability of Brandon's miss to slowly begin to dawn. In accordance with this council's instructions, Lord Redwin provided the transport six of the Arbor's best-equipped warships as escorts along the coast of Dawn. So it would appear Lord Redwin had the means of ensuring his own shipping routes after all. To the contrary, my lord. Although the escort succeeded in repelling the initial attack, they were soon set upon by a second, larger fleet of pirate vessels. Three of the warships were sunk and another two taken. All ten cargo ships were likewise lost. All? Good gods. They were carrying enough arbor gold to fill Blackwater Bay. How is it possible they were taken so unawares? Reports are confused, my lord, but it would seem that the larger part of the pirate fleet had taken anchor to the south of Gaston Grey. The Dornish Prison Island? The prison has long since been abandoned, but the island was well chosen for that purpose, little more than a sheer-faced mountain rising from the sea. While the Red Wind fleet gave battle to the northeast, the ambush sailed northwest around the coast of Gaston Grey and descended upon their rear. The Crown must answer this outrage at once, and in full force. Lucerus nods in appreciation of Rhaegar's reaction, sensing that the freedom of the seas may finally be permitted him once more after twenty long years chained to the council table. What say you, my lord Hand? Rhaegar turns his head toward Tywin, and Lucerus visibly deflates. I couldn't agree more, your grace. Wide-eyed, Lucerus blinks in disbelief. This latest escalation could likely have been averted had your instincts in favour of earlier action been heeded, and I am certain there are those among this council that feel themselves a fool for raising their voice in opposition. Lucerus glances incredulously at Carlton, Carlton at Varys, Varys at Pycelle, the eunuch and the Grand Maester united in common feeling for perhaps the first time. Lord Lucerus, the master of ships raises himself up straight, proud and expectant, like a champion show pony, ready to receive his ribbon. Send word to Driftmark. Instruct Lord Emmond to take ship for King's Landing at once. See that Lord Emmond supplies you with the names of his chosen captains before he sails, so they may assemble their crews and take on provisions while he makes his crossing. I want the royal fleet upon the waters the day after tomorrow. As Tywin speaks, Lucerus's face gradually drains of colour until his eager expression is as wan and withered as his hopes. I thought, my lord had forgive me, but I had imagined that I might lead the escort myself. Thank you, Lord Lucerus, but your presence in the capital is far too valuable to spare. Your place is here on the small council, where your expertise and experience can best serve his grace. But I... A master of ships? My brother has Your no... half-brother has been raised from birth to one day assume his father's seat as Lord of the Tides. Erastes received his first command a whole two years before he reached his adulthood, so by his own father's standard it seems to me well past time Emond did the same. Rhaegar's eyes move from Tywin to Lucerys and back again. Lord Lucerys, I understand your frustration, believe me I do. But Lord Tywin has the right of it. As long as you remain master of ships, your place is here at council. Lucerys gives no sign he has heard Rhaegar. So fixed is his focus on Tywin. Take your seat, Lord Lucerys. For a moment, it appears for all the world as though Lucerys will refuse. But in the end, Tywin's tone awakens his instincts for self-preservation, and he reluctantly does as he's commanded. Rhaegar stands. Let us leave it there for now, my lords. I fear these grievous tidings have given us more than enough with which to contend for one day. Actually, your grace, there was one further matter I hoped to raise before council. Oh? With your leave, your grace, I should like to turn our attention to the current plight of the Night's Watch. Rhaegar's eyes flit to Varys for half a heartbeat, but the Master of Whispers proves too inscrutable to read. The prince retakes his seat. Go on. I've been giving the matter a great deal of thought, 
and have come to the conclusion that several concerns of the moment might be resolved to the benefit of the Black Brothers. Sir Gerald has expressed his concern that a disreputable element of significant size may find its way to Harrenhal. So much wealth gathered in one place will appeal to such characters as an unguarded henhouse would a fox. If we were to provide Lord Went a detachment of gold cloaks, in one fell swoop we could purge the realm of a great many of its undesirables while simultaneously answering Lord Corgyle's perennial entreaties for reinforcements to his ranks. A fine notion, my lord. The watch would never turn away a man of able body. Of course, although I have always been of the mind that a soldier is only ever as able as his commanding officer. What good these reinforcements without the men experienced in arms to train them? My uncle Amon has oft bemoaned the lack of knights upon the wall, certainly. Men of good character that have experience with sword and lance and sitting a horse. Experience that could be passed on, given sufficient time and patience. If House Targaryen can find fifty such men within their ranks, then House Lannister will gladly do the same. I will also see to it that each man be issued two of everything a soldier might ordinarily carry. One for themselves, one to be donated to the armories of the Night's Watch. Rhaegar glances about the table, finding his own querulousness reflected back at him in every face but Varys's. I trust my Lord Hand will take no offence when I say, I am as surprised by the generosity of this proposal as I am by its suddenness. The Crown has been a friend to the Watch for centuries, and any friend of the Crown is perforce a friend of House Lannister, and as the good and honest masters about this table can well attest, there is very little I would not do in the service of my friends, Your Grace. Seated around one end of the long banquet table in the Great Hall of River Run, the Tully household of Hoster, Catelyn, Lysa, and Hoster's brother Brynden listen with amusement as its youngest member peppers their guest with questions, the young boy's eyes wide with wonder. Only Peter remains apart focused instead on refilling his wine glass for the third time since they sat down to supper. Are there really dire wolves in the north? I've heard they can go as big as a horse. Bigger, even. It's rare to see one these days, but I'm told they're very common north of the wall. What about shadow cats? Oh aye, more than you could count. Which would win in a fight? A dire wolf or a shadow cat? Catelyn returns Brandon's smile, charmed that he makes no objection to indulging her little brother's boyish fantasies. As much as it pains me to admit, I'd have to say the Shadow Cat would likely emerge the victor in a one on one contest. But here's the thing that would never happen. Shadow Cats are solitary beasts, while the Dire Wolf hunts in a pack. Such a noble beast. Spend a single winter in the north, my friend, and you'll soon appreciate the wisdom of wolves. Work together or die apart. It's a principle and practice that has sustained my family for centuries. Not so well that you didn't need to come begging to your friends in the South to supply you extra grain this past winter. Peter reaches for the flagon of wine to top up his cup, but Hoster discreetly moves it beyond his reach and delivers his ward a silent reproach. Are there really giants north of the wall? What about snarks or grumpkins? That's enough now, Edmure. Brandon's our guest, not your plaything. There's nothing wrong with a young boy being curious. Every time a wandering crow spent the night at Winterfell on the way south, I'd interrogate him for hours on the mysteries that lie beyond the wall. Wandering crows? Recruiters for the Watch. They travel the Seven Kingdoms in search of fresh meat for the Snarks and Grumpkins. I believe the last to visit Riveron was given his pick of your father's dungeons. A man's crimes are forgiven at the wall, sweetling. Taking the black is the only chance many men have to regain their honour and remove the stain from their family name. I'm told black is my colour. You're far too honourable a man to see out your days among murderers, thieves and rapists, Sir Brendan. I understand there's a proud tradition of stock serving in the watch. Mind your tongue, boy. If Brandon took offence at Peter's clumsy barb, he masks it well. The Night's Watch is the Seven Kingdoms' first line of defence on its northern borders, but Winterfell and House Stark are the second. Peter is not mistaken. Many of my ancestors were as impatient as they were brave. Unless I am confusing my histories, isn't it said that the very first Lord Commander was a Stark? Is that true, Brandon? Nobody knows for certain. 
The man that founded House Stark was said to be the very same that designed and oversaw construction of the wall. So it's entirely possible that he also organized the watch and appointed a younger brother as Lord Commander. So much from the Age of Heroes has been lost, Edmir, and much of what we believe to be true is plainly nothing more than fantasy. Brandon the Builder was no fantasy. The kings in the north were necessarily meticulous in recording the line of succession, and their lineage began with him. The first king in the north was called Brandon Stark too? He was, though there have been so many Brandon Starks since then, I wouldn't say I was named for him, exactly. I believe the first Brandon was a bastard, wasn't he? Half-brother to Torrin Stark, the last king in the north? What is it they call him? That's enough, lad. Ah, yes. The king who knelt. Though the subject is no less insightful to Brandon's ire than previously, he has at least learned his lesson from his spat with Catelyn to hold his temper at Peter's snide invocation. Your handle of my family's history is very impressive, my friend. Peter is awfully knowledgeable. I believe he must have read every book in Father's library. Including a history of the Northern Houses. I was curious to learn about the proud heritage our dear cat is to be married into. I also hoped it would provide some stimulating conversation over the supper table, though I fear much of it is rather inappropriate for polite company. A little too... bloody. An awkward silence descends. Catelyn shoots daggers at Lysa. Lysa half shrugs to indicate she has no part in Peter's mischief. Well, children, I believe it's past time old men retired to their beds. Brandon, sleep well, but don't sleep late. I promised your father I'd take you on a tour of the Riverlands. We'll need to ride at first light if we mean to make a decent survey. I look forward to it, my lord. I've told you already to dispense with the formalities. We're to be family soon enough. You must call me Hoster. Edmir, bed within the hour. Do you hear me? I'm far too young to be in bed so early, but far too old to be anything but a bore to my darling nieces. I shall remove myself elsewhere for the evening. Will you be accompanying us on the morrow? Good gods, no. My brother could make a tour of the Seven Hills a tedious affair. Uncle! Besides, I suffer from a long-standing allergy to an excess of sunlight. Every time I try and rise before noon, I suffer such terrible headaches and cannot eat so much as a mouthful without bringing it up again. Enjoy your evening, my young lords and ladies. Edmure, stay up as late as you like. Brynden exits, passing a coterie of servants as they descend to clear away the diner's empty plates. Mary, do you know if Darwin has baked any lemon cakes? Of course, my lady. He made them special for your father's return. Do you want me to bring some out? That would be wonderful. Thank you. Neri performs a quick head count of those still at table. Five? No, bring some for the rest of us too. <gasps> no! <laughs> Catelyn gasps in horror and tosses a heel of bread at Edmure. She looks to Brandon and blushes. They're my favourite. She eats them by the dozen. Catelyn glowers at Edmure. Brandon smiles. I shall have to remember that. Surely it's far too cold to grow lemons in the north? Not one of the Seven Kingdoms is entirely self-sufficient. The Reach provides us all with fruit and grain. Gold is mined from the Westerlands. The Iron Islands supply the iron, of course, but also lead and tin. And the Dornish. May the gods bless the Dornish. Brandon holds aloft his cup as though it were a holy relic deserving of worship. They produce the wine. And what does the North provide? Brandon looks at Peter and then downs the rest of his cup. He slams the cup on the table. The finest fighters and fuckers in all the Seven Kingdoms. In the shocked silence that follows, Peter is perturbed to discover Catelyn endeavouring and failing to hide her amusement. Doubly so when he realises that even Lysa cannot suppress a smile. For appearance's sake, Catelyn bats the arm of her betrothed in prudish reprove. Bran, really, Edmure is right there. Brandon winks at Edmure, and the boy grins broadly, delighted to be included in the grown-up's ribaldry. I hear those are talents in which you are especially well-practised, Lord Stark. Have I offended you in some way, Peter? 
Only the other day, Kat explained to me how seriously the Riverlands observed the courtesies between host and guest. Yet even in the frozen, lemonless north, we would never think of speaking to a visitor the way you have spoken to me this evening. I'm not your host, Stark. I'm only one rung up the ladder from the servants that cleared this table, and for no other reason than my father polished Lord Hoster's armor during the War of the Nine Penny Kings. My grandfather was a hedge knight, the son of a Bravosi sellsword. I can't trace my lineage back to the Age of Heroes. I have no kings among my ancestors, kneeling or otherwise. I've given no insult to your family. I've done nothing to belittle you. Just your being here belittles me. Your existence belittles me. Yours and that of everyone like you. Just by existing, you make me less. I have less wealth. I have less respected name. I'm less comely to look upon. You're shorter than him too. Your kind always gets exactly what you want, just by snapping your fingers. But that's never enough for you. You have to take whatever the rest of us have too, even if it's all we have. And what of yours have I taken, pray tell? Peter does not answer, but his eyes betray him, flitting to Catelyn, then back to Brandon. The wounded expression on Lysa's face makes plain the glance did not escape her notice. You're so pleased with yourself. So fucking proud, just because your name is Stark. That sounds like a damn good reason to me. Oh, indeed. A house built on violence by brute savages and wildling fuckers. Brandon jumps to his feet. Peter flinches away reflexively. I've cut men open for lesser insults. Summoning his bravado under Catelyn's watchful eye, Peter points at Brandon and turns to her with a look of victory. You see, Cat, from his own mouth... That's how they resolve their problems in the North. They don't think, not like civilized people. They react like animals thirsty for blood. Stop this, Peter. You're behaving like a petulant child. Brandon is a guest in my home, and he is to be my husband. You will apologize for insulting his house right this instant. Peter appears almost as startled by Catelyn's chastisement as he was Brandon's sudden rise, but he presses his lips together in mute refusal of Catelyn's command. I think it best I remove myself from this boy's company. I will not spill blood beneath your father's roof. Brandon turns and strides from the hall. Catelyn moves to follow, pausing only for an instant as she passes Peter. How dare you! Who do you think you are to play such reckless games with my future? You know exactly who I am. I'm just your father's ward, remember? And that's all you'll ever be. You're no friend of mine. Brandon! Brandon stops and turns. Catelyn comes quickly across the courtyard to meet him. I'm so sorry for Peter. He's still so young and... I'm afraid his feelings for me are a little confused. And not at all reciprocated, I trust. Don't be ridiculous. Peter is under my father's protection, and there's never been anything more than that between us. Brandon looks over her shoulder, the corners of his mouth turned down in sour humour. Not so little to his own mind, it seems. Brandon Stark! Peter has followed Catelyn and marches with purpose towards the pair. Lysa has hold of one arm, dragging on him like a ship's anchor, but he shakes her off without ever taking his eyes from Brandon. Edmure skips along behind, not fully understanding what's going on, but giddy with excitement at the unexpected drama. Peter, what are you doing? What I should have done the second this inbred northern scoundrel stepped down from his horse. You need to guard your tongue, boy. For Cat's sake, I've shown you the same forbearance I would young Edmuria. But if you throw your insults with a man's disregard, you must accept a man's consequences in return. Don't talk down to me, Stark. I'm not afraid of you. I think maybe you should be. Lysa, please, make him see sense. Peter, I beg you, don't do this! Listen to the Lady Lysa, Baelish. She's trying to stop you from making a mistake you may not walk away from. Peter takes the last step closer to Brandon. He looks him up and down as though assessing livestock, then looks to Catelyn with a contemptuous sneer. This is what you want. Truly, a man half beast in nature, with all the intelligence of the mangy cur he wears on his leathers. Lightning fast, Brandon grabs Peter by the collars of his doublet, raising the smaller man onto his toes. Brandon, don't. He had too much wine at supper. He doesn't know what he's saying. 
Catelyn places a placating hand on Brandon's arm. He breaks his death stare with Peter and looks at Catelyn's hand, follows the turquoise lace of her sleeve until he's looking into the ocean blue of her wide, imploring eyes. Please, Brandon. The moment balances on a knife edge, the silence of the courtyard absolute, as though the world itself were holding its breath. Finally, Brandon releases his grip on Peter. If you were not my lady's favourite pet. Brandon turns his back dismissively on the stricken Peter and continues on his way. Shaking her head in disgust at her father's ward, Catelyn follows her betrothed. Peter looks to Lysa, and then to Edmure, but neither will meet his eye, as though he were something too shameful to look upon. His face hardens. Very well, Stark. If violence is the only language you truly understand, then allow me to speak in your native tongue. I challenge you to a duel. Peter, no! You do not want to die tonight, little finger. I will not be the one dying, Stark, and you will not be the one marrying Cat. The tree line, north of the main gate, one hour from now. Mother! Oh, my babies! <laughs> Riella waits at the door, the infant Aegon in her arms, and Cersei and Lewin at her back. Prince Viserys pays no mind to the emotional reunion, making a beeline for the tray of cakes and pastries set out on the table. Elia returns Rhaenys to the ground and takes her son from Rhaella, showering the mewling babe's forehead in kisses. I trust this settles my debt, Your Grace? Elia kisses her palm and blows it to her uncle by way of confirmation. Then I shall be on the door should you have further need of me. Elia's face somehow lights up even further as she notices Cersei for the first time, lingering awkwardly apart. And look, you brought me another visitor. Cersei produces a handkerchief from her sleeve and hands it to Elia. What must you think of me, crying like a fool? Nonsense. A mother should never feel embarrassed to show how much she loves her children. Elia dabs her tears dry and returns the handkerchief to Cersei, so preoccupied with Aegon that she doesn't even register the handkerchief's Targaryen colouring. I hope I am not intruding, Your Grace. Don't be ridiculous. It's been far too long since I had the pleasure of your company. Come, let's enjoy the sun before it disappears for the day. Elia leads her guests to the balcony, where the last light of day casts the city below a melancholy gold. Elia sits with Aegon on her lap, bouncing him on her knee to the boy's evident delight. Rhaenys crawls up beside her, burrowing herself in the crook of Elia's arm. Bella, the servant girl, appears with a tray of Dornish red for Elia's guest. When Bella presents the tray to the host, Elia shakes her head in demurral. Oh, come, Elia. One glass won't hurt. We've broken one rule today, why not another? Elia hesitates, then grins guiltily and accepts a glass. She takes a long drink, savouring the taste. Oh, God, that's good. Pycel hasn't let me touch a drop in months. The maesters advise you abstain during pregnancy? Advise? They positively proselytize. Now he tells me he could counteract the benefits of these vile concoctions he's got me drinking. That be all, Your Grace. Thank you, sweetling. You can leave us for now, but be sure and help yourself to some of those cakes for you and your brothers. Bella bows and departs. Elia notices Cersei's eyes lingering on Bella's blue forearms. They can be a little shocking at first, I know. Poor little thing was working in a draper's before she came to us. Oh, you needn't apologize. I've lost all abilities to be surprised at oddities living with Tyrion all these years. Elia is momentarily struck by Cersei's casual cruelty and seems ready to speak in Bella's defense, but Rayella places a mollifying hand on her leg and the princess lets Cersei's faux pas pass without comment. 
Although his own plate is already heavy laden, Viserys greedily snatches up each cake in which the girl shows any interest. Viserys, you leave that girl alone. Hurrying indoors to corral her wayward son, Rayella leaves the two younger women alone on the balcony. Elia leans conspiratorially towards Cersei. She would be embarrassed to hear me say this, but Rayella was so excited when she learned you were coming to court. I don't believe I've ever seen her so happy. Her grace has been most kind. Of course she has. She knows no other way. She did the same for me when I first came to court. I would have fled straight home to Sunspear before the moon had even turned had Rayella not taken me under her wing. It was as though she could somehow sense just exactly what it was I needed, and offered it without question. It must have been very lonely for you, leaving home at such a young age. That too, most certainly. But I was speaking more to my mother's passing. It all happened so fast, you see. One day I was sitting by her sickbed, and the next Sir Arthur was sailing into port carrying the King's proposal. Were it not for my change in dress from morning clothes to bridal gown, I'm not certain I could tell you even now where one pain ended and the other began. Forgive me, Your Grace, I had no idea. There's nothing to forgive, sweet girl, but you really must call me Elia. Now Riella has adopted you for her own, you and I may as well be sisters, and there can be no airs and graces between sisters. Of course. Elia. Rayella returns to the balcony, dragging Prince Viserys by the arm, his face indignant from his mother's scolding. Now sit there and behave yourself, young man, or I shall take those cakes away and you'll have naught to chew but your tongue for the rest of the day, do you hear me? Viserys makes no reply, but sits cross-legged on the floor and sets to demolishing his plate of treats. The first boy in the history of the Seven Kingdoms to play the martyr while shoving a succession of cakes into his downturned mouth. Please excuse my son, Cersei. For all the time they spend together, he stubbornly refuses to learn from his niece's good example. Rhaenys beams at her grandmother's approbation, smirking superciliously at Viserys's protruding tongue. Elia kisses the top of her daughter's head adoringly as the young princess strokes the silver wisps of baby Aegon's hair. Cersei watches Elia's affection with a curiously pinched expression, unaware that she too is under observation. Rayella studying Cersei's reaction to this picture of familial intimacy with appraisive scrutiny. Thank you for this, Rayella. Shifting her interest away from Cersei, the Queen retrieves her glass from the table and waves a dismissive hand. Best thank your Uncle Lewin, my dear. I never have been able to refuse a man in armour. His grace must have been rather dashing in his day. Cersei is dismayed to see the effect her words have on Rayella, the Queen almost choking on her mouthful of wine. <laughs> oh heavens no! The only plate my husband knows is the one on which his supper is served. But surely, during the war? No, oh, I suppose so. You know how little boys do so love to play at dress-up. I do believe Rayella had someone else in mind. A certain knight of the Stormlands, perhaps? Now there was a man fit to make any maiden forget her virtue. Honestly, Cersei, I can't tell you how many times I've badgered Rayella to tell me the story of this mysterious long-lost love of hers. It's all ancient history now, and it does an old woman no good to dwell on what might have been. You really must stop calling yourself an old woman, Rayella. The first time I met you, I could have taken you for Rhaegar's sister rather than his mother. That's exactly what I said only this morning. It has always been the privilege of the elderly to speak as they please, and it pleases this old woman to refer to herself as such. In fact, I believe I shall make a toast. Rayella raises her glass, and Elia and Cersei do likewise. The Queen tips her glass to each in turn. To the mother, the maiden, and the crone. May the gods keep and protect them all. Illuminated by the full moon overhead, Brandon, Catelyn and Edmure wait at the tree line, overlooking the wide open fields that slope gently down towards River Run. Please, Brandon. Swear to me you will not force this duel to the death. Your little friend insulted my house. He insulted the North. Peter is a foolish boy that imagines himself in love. 
He speaks like a man grown to avoid losing face, but he has no business fighting with swords. Is this true, Edmer? Littlefinger has spent some time in the yard of late, but I still beat him more often than not. Brandon sighs, his expression almost one of disappointment. <sighs> there is little honour to be had in killing a novice. Catelyn steps closer, placing a hand on Brandon's chest. Please, I implore you, for the love that may one day exist between us, please, show him mercy. Before Brandon can answer, Peter and Lysa appear through the moonlight and make their approach. Peter pulls his sword from the sheath tethered to his saddle. Even at their remove, Brandon cannot help but take note of how inelegantly he holds his blade. I cannot promise I will leave him entirely unmarked. He must still answer for his insults, but I will spare his life. Thank you, Brandon. For the second time that day, Catelyn kisses Brandon on the cheek. I will not forget this. Lysa leaves Peter practicing his swing against the tree and joins her siblings. He is determined to see this madness to the end. Please, Cat, he will not listen to me, but a word from you. He cannot possibly believe he can win. Perhaps he hopes to martyr himself. Father might think twice about marrying his daughter to a man that murdered his own ward. Shut up, Edmure! Or maybe he thinks Cat will be so overcome by his bravery in the face of certain death that she will fall as madly in love with him as you are. Why are you even here? This is no place for little boys. You might try and explain as much to Peter. Scowling at her sister, Lysa turns and stalks back to her beloved. Why are you here? Why not over there with Lysa and Peter? Brandon will be family soon enough. You and Brandon have Lisa beat two to one by my count. Catelyn smiles and wraps an arm about Edmure's shoulders. Cat, I fight this brute for you. It is only fitting that I wear your favour once again. May I have that honour, my lady. I do not want this, Peter. Catelyn reaches behind her head and removes the ribbon from her hair. But Brandon is to be my husband. This time he shall wear my favour. She takes Brandon's free hand in hers and ties the ribbon about his wrist. Peter takes a step towards them, but Lysa wraps herself about his arm and pulls him back. One last time, I beg of you, Peter, do not do this. Apologise to Brandon and let that be an end to it. Do it for me, Peter, please, in the name of love. Lysa, my sweet, that is precisely the reason I must fight. If nothing I say can deter you, then here. Retrieving Peter's arm, Lysa draws her handkerchief and tucks it into his sleeve. Take my favour and my kiss. Peter bears his cheek to Lysa, but she turns his head and kisses his lips instead, then rejoins Catelyn and Edmure beneath the trees. With the formalities over, Peter and Brandon close the distance between them and begin to circle one another. Beg forgiveness for your insults, Baelish, and we can end this right now. This will end when I plunge my sword into your belly, Stark. Peter lunges forward, looking to make short work of Brandon by skewering him through the middle. Brandon dances aside and Peter stumbles, barely keeping his feet. I regret only that Barbary Dustin did not have her own champion to defend her honor as I defend cats. Don't speak of things you know nothing about, boy. Peter comes again. Brandon dodges once more, but this time he spins about and draws his blade up the back of Peter's calf. Peter drops to one knee, clutching his leg. Lysa tries to come to his aid, but Catelyn and Edmure hook their arms about her middle and hold her at bay. Now yield! Enraged at the sight of his own blood, Peter rushes headlong at Brandon, his sword raised like a club above his head. Brandon stands his ground, swiping Peter's sword away into the grass and driving his free hand into Peter's jaw. <laughs> Peter staggers backwards, then drops onto his backside like a toddler still learning to properly grapple with gravity. Yield! Lysa breaks free from her siblings and throws herself to the ground beside Peter. Please, Peter, that's enough! Do as he says! Peter rises to his knees and shoves Lysa aside. 
Catelyn and Edmure rush to her defence, but Peter has already turned away, scrabbling about in the grass in search of his sword. He finds it at Brandon's feet. I shall say it a third time, but no, there will not be a fourth. Yield. Cat might not thank me for this today, but she will eventually understand the heartache I am saving her from. You will hurt her, you will shame her, but I will not allow that to happen. Sighing, Brandon kicks the sword to Peter. Abandoning any pretense of form, Peter clutches his sword in both hands and throws himself forward, swinging his arms back and forth as though it were a mace he brandished, rather than a blade. Almost lazily, Brandon sidesteps Peter's advance and sticks out a boot to trip him. When he rolls over onto his back, he finds the point of Brandon's sword pointed at his throat. Yield or not, this farce is over. Propped upon his elbows, Peter looks imploringly towards Catelyn. Whatever fight may still remain in his body drains away at what he finds in her face, and he slowly nods his surrender to Brandon. Brandon lowers his sword and turns away, walking back to offer Lysa a hand up from the ground where Peter left her. Edmure tentatively approaches Peter, crouching down and resting a hand on his shoulder. He didn't kill me. Why didn't he kill me? Cat made him swear to it. She begged him for your life and he took pity on you. The realization of just how pathetic Catelyn really believes him to be stabs Peter like a white-hot knife to the heart. His jaw tightens, his eyes narrow, his hands bawling into fists of impotent rage. He snatches up his sword and runs at Brandon's back. Brandon pushes Catelyn to safety and turns to meet Peter's charge. His first stroke drives Peter's blade harmlessly aside. His second splits Peter open from belt to collar. No, 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 no! Lysa flies to Peter's side, but hasn't the slightest notion how to help once she reaches him. He stands stone still and stupefied, staring down through his shredded doublet at his slowly separating torso. Peter! Peter! Without a word, Brandon sheathes his sword and walks away towards the waiting horses. Catelyn hesitates, lingering beside Lysa and Edmure as they struggle together to turn Peter over onto his back. Edmure senses her indecision and reaches up her hand. Cat? Catelyn looks down at Peter's exposed innards, Lysa trying desperately to press together the two sides of the gaping trench that bisects his body. She looks to the tree line, to the waiting Brandon. Edmure sees her face set hard and decided, her mind settled at the sight of her betrothed sitting tall in his saddle. I'll send Maester Kim. He'll know how to help him. With that, Catelyn hurries to Brandon's mount and clambers up behind him, wrapping her arms about his middle. Brandon kicks his heels into the horse's flank, and he and Catelyn gallop away together across the silent and spectral fields of moonlit midnight. The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. It was unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorised. Neither the podcast, nor any individual involved in its production, is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be, entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution 
that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoyed it.